Cleopas, I want to thank you for this uh, interview that you are doing with me uh, some 2,000 years after the death of Jesus. I think there are some things that we could learn from your own experience and some things that would inspire us and, and, and allow our hearts to be ignited again with a passion for our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself and help us to learn a little bit about you and your experiences some 2,000 years ago. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Cleopas. Actually, you've read a lot more about me than you probably know. Luke records my name, but not only Luke, also John. He mentions me as the husband of one of the women named Mary that was standing near the cross. My given name was Calphi in Aramaic. And in Greek, that can be transliterated as klopas or uh, alpheos, which is uh, in Latin, alpheus. That, you may remember, is the name of the, the given father of James in all four of the list of the twelve disciples. Not to be confused with the older James of Zebedee. Uh, which is Jesus' cousin on his mother's side. But you see, if people would read a little bit more closely, they would see these little details. I'm not an insignificant nobody after all. I'm the father of one of the twelve apostles. I'm the husband of one of the women who stood near the cross and who went early that Sunday morning into Jesus' tomb. My family was at the very heart of the circle of Jesus' followers throughout his ministry and up to the very end. You may be interested in knowing that my, my acquaintance with Jesus is still even closer. If you've read uh, the great historian, 4th century church historian, Eusebius, uh, then you would discover that I'm the brother of Joseph of Nazareth, Jesus' legal father. Jesus, you see, was my nephew, so he would call me Uncle Cleo. My acquaintance with Jesus goes back as far as his very birth. I want to share with you a little story that occurred after Jesus' death. After Jesus' death, he was placed in the tomb. At the first sign of light on that Sunday morning, I returned with my wife and with Mary Magdalene to the Zebedee house. Salome had gone to the market to obtain spices, so all through the women went off to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus in burial. I waited there with Zebedee, John, and Peter for some time. All of a sudden, we heard a woman's frantic voice and footsteps fast approaching. It was Mary Magdalene. She said that when they arrived at the tomb, they found someone had come and stolen Jesus' body. In an instant, Peter and John ran off to see for themselves, but I remained behind. Then, not too much later, the other women returned also with my wife and Salome. They said that after Mary Magdalene had left the tomb, they went in and they saw the empty grave clothes. That's right, empty grave clothes. And they said the linens were exactly as they had left them on Friday. Only they were empty. There was no thief. The clothes were undisturbed. It was as if the body had just vanished. And they said an angel appeared to them and told them that Jesus had risen just as he had said. And that they should go and tell all the disciples. But this kind of thing was simply impossible and I didn't believe them. I couldn't, but undaunted, the two went off to fulfill their commission to tell all the disciples. I decided to return to Emmaus. Luke went with me, and as we walked, we rehearsed all the things that had happened. As we walked, a man came up to us, 
and he asked us what we were talking about and why we were so sad. I didn't recognize him at first, but we said, where are you from? Don't you know all the things that have happened in Jerusalem over the past three days? What things, he asked. The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a, a prophet that was mighty in word indeed, who was crucified. We were hoping all along that he was going to redeem Israel, but now, now today, some of our women went to the tomb and they found it was empty and they saw angels who told them he was alive again but when the two of the men went to investigate they found the tomb empty all right but they didn't see jesus and we frankly don't know what's happened to him then do you know what he said to us this stranger said you fools you have never read your Bible. And within minutes he set our hearts pounding as he opened scriptures for us as we had never seen them before. We had no copies of the scriptures with us. But this man didn't need it. He had it all within himself. Not only was it memorized, its whole significance and the saving plan of God was firmly fixed in his mind, and that significance he explained to us in detail. It was not just Moses' law only, but the whole of scriptures in its larger picture and its details. He saw it all as pointing forward and having direct bearing, indeed final fulfillment, in Jesus smoldering embers of our faith began to flicker again. He took us back to the very beginning and, and showed us ideas in Scripture that struck our hearts. And when we arrived in Emmaus, this stranger seemed intent on going further. But we weren't about to let him go. We, we finally prevailed on him and convinced him to come and eat dinner with us. And when we sat at the table, I was the host. But he took the bread and blessed it. And he broke it and he gave it to us to eat. And then all of a sudden, we looked at him as if for the first time all day. It was Jesus. He was alive. There he was at my table. No wonder this stranger knew so well the whole plan of God. It was a plan of his, his very own making and doing. But just as soon as we recognized him, he was gone. He, he seemed to vanish out of our sight. We looked at each other with both fear and amazement. Our faith in Jesus was vindicated. He was alive. I believed, but I couldn't believe it. We had seen him ourselves. We talked with him. He was alive again. That was not the last time we saw him. During the following days and weeks, he showed himself on many occasions. Once to above 500 of us at once. And yes, I was there in Bethany when he ascended to heaven. Well, that's my story. What's important is not that I was Jesus' uncle. And no, it is not important that all of you remember me, except that that you remember me as one who can affirm firsthand that Jesus is alive. I saw him, I touched him, I talked with him, and I ate with him. He is risen just as he said. Listen, the faith that is proclaimed here in this church is a well-founded one. The great object of our faith is not a good man who spoke well and did nice things and who died. 
the great object of our faith is the Lord from heaven who came and lived among us and died for us and lives again as our faithful and eternal high priest and king. If the faith you profess for salvation is founded in him, you rest in good hands.